This is a production of Cornell University. And it's a real pleasure today to be beginning with a unique topic and having uh, Barbara Lang join us. Um, restaurant owner, schooner chef, university lecturer, career advisor, and founder of The Etiquette Factor, Barbara has been providing support and counsel for more than 30 years. Early on, she was a Napa Valley Winery Culinary Director, hosting hundreds of dining events and establishing a reputation as a gracious and entertaining host. For the past two decades, Barbara has been advising Cornell University students on their personal and professional paths. Once described as a blend of Betty Crocker and Bette Midler, <laughs> Barbara loves to inform us with humor and grace and shares her belief that once you know the rules of proper protocol for particular settings, you can then figure out how to artfully break them. Barbara's most recent adventures include going across the country with her husband in a 1984 Westphalia camper van visiting over 10 national parks, <laughs> <laughs> and sailing around the world with Semester at Sea as the Adult Lifelong Learning Coordinator. Um, Barbara has two daughters, the eldest Rachel, some of us know, she graduated from our plant sciences program in 2009. So um, I'm going to pass these around the room. They may inform some questions you have later on. I think I'll just do a chunk on each side here. And we'll make sure that we get uh, one of these to those of you in Geneva so that you'll um, have an opportunity to follow up with Barbara if you wish. So without you. further ado, thank you. Well, thank you, and hello. Hello. <laughs> oh, good, thank you. <laughs> You can leave whenever you want, I won't be hurt. <laughs> um, well, I really am delighted that you all are here, and thank you. Whenever I hear that bio, I think that I'm really old. Um, they go the 30 years, the decades are on it. And there is a book called 150 Food Jobs. I've had 43 of them, which means either I'm really old, I can't keep a job, um, or I get distracted by shiny objects. And I think there's a combination of all three of those. Uh, but I do want to be able to talk about, the first thing I want to talk about are toilets. Uh, because <laughs> and the reason for that is that uh, I went downstairs. You have an unusual building. Uh, when a woman needs a restroom on the fourth floor, and it's a little bit of an obstacle course to get in there. So Marsha said, just go down the stairs, turn around, go down the hallway, you'll be on your left, and you'll find it. I immediately got lost as soon as I got out of the stairwell. And I'm standing there, and a woman came up to me, and she said, can I help you? And I said, does it look like I need to go to the bathroom? <laughs> and she said, no, but that was courtesy. All right, that was her showing me where the bathroom was, which brings me to Japan. Now, you're going to find that as I'm talking, it's sort of like putting your seatbelt on, is that I'm going to start going down a path, and then I am going to get distracted, and I'm going to go down another path. I might go down another path, but I will come back to the major avenue again. So just kind of follow along. The handout that you have is kind of like a road map, but it's also like a takeout menu. So if you see something on there that you really would like me to be able to touch upon, I really do encourage all of you to be able to just raise your hand and be able to interact so that I'm not just a talking head up here. I was on Semester at Sea, and I was the adult lifelong learner. And if you want to learn how to be able to interact with people, live with them on a ship for four months. Uh, there are 500 students aboard Semester at Sea, and then there were also 60 to 80 adult lifelong learners. I was the coordinator for the lifelong learners. And there is something when you deal with people, and the idea is that you want to be able to create an experience so that it's memorable to them. And it's about how do you take 60 people, so it'd be a group like this, every day, and making sure that everybody is getting what it is that they need. And the way that you do that, I'll be talking about today, is kind of getting that awareness. But back to Japan and toilets. <laughs> because toilets do seem to um, rock my mind a little bit these days. Um, the reason I want to talk about Japan is that if you want to learn about courtesy, you go to Japan. Anyone here from Japan? A, rem all right, a remarkable country for people who know uh, about courtesy and politeness. And I might be saying it wrong, so if you could please correct me. It's called tenye, uh, courteous politeness, tenye. Is 
that the word? Tene. Tene. Thank you. So tene um, means courteous or polite. And it also means in Japan um, to be able to act with respect to people. And their toilets actually do this. If you've never been in a toilet stall in Japan, you sit down and there is a console. I mean, there is basically an amazing amount of options that you have. When you go down to the bathrooms at Cornell, you can see, as you know, you know, you, you don't look at the bathroom stall when you're walking by. You kind of want to look to see whether it's used or not. So you go underneath, but we have wide openings that are astonishingly revealing if you want them to be. Well, in Japan, they're entirely closed. And then you can actually, you can press these buttons so that there are sounds. So you know if you're having a little trouble and it's a large bathroom, you just press a button and it's the toilet flushing. It's just the sound of the toilet flushing. And all of a sudden, if you're a little cold, there's a warmer to it. You need a little drying, there's a dryer to it. I am not kidding. And there's also one button because a friend of mine on the ship pressed it because she didn't know what it was and the police arrived. So you need to be careful as to what buttons you push. But it is all about accommodating somebody's needs. Now, um, in your handout, there is something that I call, I don't call it, Malcolm Gladwell calls it, called thin slicing. I don't know if you know what that is or not, but it used to be that it would take people anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes to basically make an assessment about you. And then they said, no, you know what, it's really more like seven minutes. Then it was down to three minutes. It's now down to five to seven seconds. That without us even knowing it, we have intuitively made an assessment about somebody. And it's going to take a long time. They say it's going to take about 200 pieces of information in your brain to convince you that you were wrong. All right, so whatever that is, that person's a jerk. Right? So for whatever reason you had decided that in your subconscious, it's going to take you now a while to be able to reverse that opinion because we don't like to admit, particularly in our subconscious, that we might have been wrong. So thin slicing is really about creating that first impression. So part of this is about how do you go ahead and do that. Now if you look at that handout that I have, there's a handout that they're getting and that you'll see that there's a picture of, tw of twins, a pair of twins, and that they're identical. Their hair is the same, their dress is the same, their headband, everything is the same, but what's different? Uh, one person is smiling, and that is really about what's called emotional contagion. In other words, that when someone is looking at somebody else, or I'm looking at a room of people, uh, you are going to gravitate towards the person who looks as though they're engaged, who looks as though they're smiling, or you're going to reflect what they're doing. Someone smiles at you, you smile back at them again. If someone is frowning, you're not going to keep on smiling because you're probably going to kind of absorb their reaction. So it's the idea of which twin would you want to be, the smiling one or the not smiling one. Now this also brings me to when you're in a group like this, and I am going to jump around a little bit. Last semester, no, uh, in the spring, I went to a panel and there was a professor from Cornell. She was in, excuse me, she was in landscape architecture. And she was nervous. And I remember just sitting there and there was a man in the front seat and there he was on his little smartphone. He was just pecking away, entirely self-absorbed. And she is talking to the group and I just, you know, I, I was enjoying it and the, it was over. Then I was at a Green Star and I saw her maybe a week later. And I said, you know, I was at a panel discussion, you were at it, I really enjoyed your presentation on urban architecture, gardening. She said, oh, you're the woman with the friendly face. <laughs> People pick up on it, um, and it wasn't like I'm like this the whole time, and you know, you're not that bobbing head in the back of the car, that little creature, but it is that idea of what is it that you are going to be sending out to people. Now, when I do presentations and I talk about etiquette, when I ask people, when you hear the word etiquette, what do you think? And people have said, I think of manners. I think of politeness. One person said, I think of the queen. One other person said, I think of corsets. I have no idea what that means. I don't want to know what that means. Um, but etiquette, etiquette, Lady Gaga. Right? Here is a person, and I'm being quite serious, that is a good representation of etiquette. If you take a look at the picture, there's a photo they have, and it is of the Queen of England and of Lady Gaga. And if you look at the face of the Queen in England, what is she doing? She is smiling. Um, and why is that? Because Lady Gaga, one, has clothes on. This is good, right? And two, Lady Gaga, she's curtsying and bowing to the queen. In other words, Lady Gaga is acting in a way that is making the queen comfortable. Etiquette is about showing respect 
and acknowledgement and appreciation for another person. That's what etiquette is. And you know, I, when I went across country, we were um, in the Grand Tetons. And in the Grand Tetons, they even had, and I brought it here, they had a little handout. And it was about bears. And it is about bear etiquette. It literally says bear etiquette. And what do you do when you meet a bear? Um, and then they go ahead and they tell you not much. All right? So they go ahead and they tell you what it is you should do. And when I think of them, I think of the wildlife. And then I do think of Lady Gaga. And I think that when she's on stage, you know, she is going to a certain audience. And she's acting in a way that her little monsters, or whatever they're called, um, she knows, oh, right here, yes, yes, we're monsters. Um, and she's acting in a way that won't disappoint them. You know, and it is about her knowing the people and that she's shifting her behavior depending upon the people that she's with. And that's what it shows with her and the Queen of England. It's not about being um, inauthentic. It's about thinking, how can I act so I make the other person feel comfortable? That's what etiquette is. Um, and the other part, the manners, the protocol, is sort of that expected behavior that people expect with one another. Now, before I came here today, I bought two books. I have a library of books. I just love reading about this stuff. And uh, there are two books that I bought, and I just wanted to bring them up because it was interesting. They're both by single white men from New York City. <coughs> One is a lawyer, and one is a writer. And the lawyer is Philip Gal Galanins. I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, but if you ever get the New York Times in the Sunday section, he does the advice column. He's an etiquette <coughs> on this. And it's really kind of funny because everything that he talks about, he uses graphs. Right? Everything is very sort of um, laid out. Here's the x-axis and the y-axis and all that. But it's, about, it's not about, oh, what fork should you use? What should you do here? It's about how do you act so it's the most appropriate. And the book is, first I thought, here's a thin slicing. Right? I am guilty of this all the time. I'm reading his column, and I read the book, and I thought, a little snarky. You know, there's a little sarcasm every time that he is writing his little column. It's always a quip. And then I went to his website, and then I found out that his father committed suicide. And then I started reading the back story. And all of a sudden you realize that there's a lot more to someone than what you're just seeing. So don't always jump to those conclusions about someone's behavior until you know the whole story about them. And that was sort of my own lesson of, whoops, did it again, made a judgment, and you know, I need to, and I'm not saying that because he had this horrible tragedy occur in his life, but I'm just saying that the guy did not fit my immediate oppression when I started to read about him. Um, and it's, as someone else put it, uh, uh, you know, putting on your orthopedic shoes, and which means I stand corrected. Right? So, and that is written by, uh, and that is written by one man. And, and I didn't, I didn't really like Philip's book as much as this man. And I remember I love the title of the book. And the title of the book is "Would It Kill You to Stop Doing That?" <laughs> and that this is done by Henry Alford, and that this is a great book. And it's a great book because it's done by a writer. So if in fact you're at all interested in learning and just reading more about this, may I suggest a book by somebody who actually knows how to write really well. And I'm going to be quoting him a lot just because he is so, so good at what he does. But as I'm going down, um, I want to be able to talk about what the, the park rangers oh, talk about. Excuse me. <laughs> hey? They got muted. Who got muted? You they got muted. muted. Okay. Okay, some Geneva. People, Thank some you. Some people wish that were true. <laughs> <laughs> we actually didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> Are we all back? Are we back? I think so. Can you wave if we're back? They said yes. Okay. Yes, okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. Uh, a couple of things I want to be able to say about another author, because I, of all these readings, I just want to be reminded of this. There's another author, and his name is P.M. Fiorini, and he is a professor of literature at John Hopkins, and he started what's called the Civility Project, and that he is professor of Italian literature. And he said, and I really like this, he said, the way in which you know and how you should assess your day is whether or not are you contributing to somebody's um, misery or are you lessening the burden of living. 
Now that's a little dramatic in the way it's said in my paraphrase. I know, it's like mayo, right? I mean, but if you think about it as the way in which that you interact with people, are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? And a lot of that can even come off in body language. And I'll give you an example. Anyone here ever uh, listen to the dog whisperer or know the dog whisperer, Cesar Milan? All right, so if you don't know him, this is a remarkable story of a man who came to this country, didn't know the language at all, but he had this amazing connection with dogs. He's now a multimillionaire, and that he trains dysfunctional dogs. So he knows that if something's wrong with the dog, he can just connect with them. And so they did a study on him. They had dance movement experts watch Cesar Milan. And because they wanted to know how could this five foot two man have such command. And they called it phrasing. And it's body language and it's a combination of gesture and posture. In other words, when you are meeting with somebody and you're making an impression, the body language is remarkable as part of that way of assessing somebody. So if someone is walking in like this, right? I mean, clearly it is somebody that um, is not feeling particularly confident or happy, whatever. Cesar Milan walks in with his upper half of his body, his shoulders back, and he walks with intent. And he walks in a way in a room so that at least the dogs pay attention. But other people pay attention to it. And I'm not saying, but I'm saying to think about your body language when you are meeting with people. Um, and may I, um, I want to also talk about, I'm going to grab this chair for a moment. Because when you are speaking with somebody, and uh, men seem to do this, and I, don't worry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rag on the women too. But, but uh, men's went, really? What are you going to say about the men? <laughs> is that sometimes men, when they're in a conversation, and I think everybody can see me, and I just had this in a meeting with somebody, and it was an official professional meeting, and this is how the man sat. <laughs> I don't get it. Um, but may I just say that that is not particularly a professional way to be sitting, and I doubt if President Scorton came into that gentleman's office, whether he would be sitting that way with the president. Um, so it really is something of how it is that you're going to sit with someone. And even in an audience like this, when you think about it, the, the, and in a classroom, you know, when, you, when you're sitting, and even if you're really tired, um, and you're a student, and you're sitting, and you're just exhausted, um, and you could have lots of reasons for being exhausted, but the thing is to realize that the person up front doesn't know those reasons, and that when they're scanning the room, and they see someone that is in a physical state that clearly is looking like they're not engaged, those impressions are really getting mixed into their heads. So it's for you, it's not a one-way mirror. I want to just put it that way. I'm always amazed, particularly when there are company recruiters here on campus, and that it's as though the students think that you can't see them. Right? Because they're in a suit, but they're still like, you know, their body language is stuff. So just to recognize that that whole body language does say something about you. And because this is about courtesy, it's about the idea of anticipating or giving people what I like to think of as unanticipated value. You know, is there something that you can do? And this is, I'm going to give you just a scenario of walking into an office, a daily walk into the office, right? Um, and you're walking in, and today I drove in. Drove in, it was a toll booth, I had to get a parking ticket, a uh, parking pass, gotta talk to you about the parking now. <laughs> um, and the woman couldn't take my credit card, couldn't take my credit card, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, my, my window isn't opening, so I have to stand, I'm in the slush, she can't make it work, she needs another credit card, can't make it work. I have a choice. I have control over my attitude. <coughs> Now, for those of you that are old enough to remember Mad Magazine, there used to be a little strip, and there'd be a little bubble, and that bubble would be what I'm thinking, and it would be quite different than what I'm speaking. Um, today, it seems that there's not always that particular filter going on, and that we feel like it's okay to like, let it be known how I feel. Well, you don't. You don't need to let people know how it is that you're feeling. It's called wearing your weather. Stephen Covey calls it wearing your weather. Um, uh, Stephen Covey wrote the book, What Seven Effective Habits for People, or you know, Live Happily Ever After. But the idea is that just because you might not be having a good day, you don't need to let everybody else know that you're not having a good day. Particularly true when you walk into an office, you walk into a classroom, whatever that might be. Danny Meyer, who wrote Setting the Table, who is like one of the premier hospitality gurus in this country, has fabulous restaurants because they're so good at customer service. He calls it skunking. 
Uh, just because you are having a bad day, you don't need to be spraying everybody else around you so that now it stinks for everybody. So as I'm standing there in the slush, not getting my credit card done, I have a choice. I can either be, hey, there's a car behind me, I'm in a rush, can you, can you please figure this out? Or would another credit card, I mean, it's that attitude. It's that whole idea of the attitude. And we do this all the time. We do it when we get a cup of coffee. We have the headphones in. And all of a sudden, we're getting the cup of coffee, and that person is anonymous, right? You give the coffee, you're going out. It's that idea of being engaged with whoever is right in front of you. It's taking, not just turning the music off, it's literally taking the headphones out of your ears so you can look at someone and say, thank you. And then you can go back, or you're on the phone. Hold on for a minute. And you look at someone and you say, thank you. Um, people have these little courtesies that they kind of forget because there's a rush. Now some people think that etiquette is elitism. Etiquette is for people who are snobby. Now, etiquette is about manners that are about interaction with people and it's about recognizing that we have differences, that we all have differences. And that if you acknowledge those differences, well then the manners and the etiquette is about how can you avoid miscommunication? How can you avoid not being misunderstood? Which is why even if I were in the same group of people that were just like me, right? They were all women, 57 years old, and that they were uh, you know, Jewish from Long Island, and, and, they were, and we were all in a room together, we would still be completely different. We had a lot of things in common, but we're still completely different. So it's not just, I'm not talking culturally, oh, if you're with somebody from another country, no. I mean with anybody, is that it's that idea of how do you have that kind of communication that's gonna be going on. So you're walking in the office, I'm back in the middle of the day, right? you walk in the office, and there's a meeting that you're gonna to have to go to. So you can have a typical meeting, people come in, and everyone is seated down, and someone new comes in the room. If anybody comes new to the room, and even when I came around here and I was introducing myself, if someone walks up to you to shake your hand, you stand up. It's just courtesy for you to stand up and shake hands rather than just remaining yourself sitting down. It's gender neutral. When you, I used to go to a meeting and a woman would be a posted, and that's what she would write her notes on. So what do you think that tells the person who's running the meeting? That they've got a little one inch by one inch post-it that she is basically sending the message, I don't think there's very much that I'm gonna to need to be taking notes about. Or the person who has their Blackberry, and I love this, everyone comes in with their PDAs and they slap them on the table like they're, like they're you know, guns, like you know, take them out of their holster, they slap them down, and it's like, you bore me for a second, I'm going to it, right? And it's like that warning, and some people, they'll just keep on, Going. Now, you know, I can't say what's right and what's wrong because you're going to find that in any situation, the culture of the people in the room is going to dictate what's going to be appropriate. But that's what's key. The key is you've got to know what's going to be appropriate depending upon who's in the room with you. Now, in the meetings that I would have to attend, it was not appropriate for this one young person, the rest of us being of an older age and generation, for them to keep on checking their messages the whole time because it was that whole idea of disengagement. And it's a lunch meeting. Here's another meeting I used to go to. I, I, um, we'd all be there, be lunch, and there's one woman, and she would have her sandwich, and she would go ahead and she would take a bite of that sandwich, and then it would always be, I swore, it was always peanut butter and jelly on, on white bread, because it was nice and soft, and it kind of just stuck together. And how do I know this? Because I was able to watch it a lot in her mouth. Because as she took the bite, she'd keep on talking, and she and you would just, I mean, you would just watch it. Uh, you know, just absolutely fascinated, and I was like, please swallow it, please swallow it. And then she'd just pick up that sandwich again, you're going, no, not anymore. Uh, but, it, you know, people don't, I mean, you know, you laugh, but I would be at events, and this was, a, it was all true stories, but this one young man took his fork, and he stabbed his food, and he lifted an entire piece of lamb, and he began to peck at it and eat it all around. Now, you know, we laughed. This was a really nice young man. He had no idea that what he was doing was not typical for the people that were at that table. So the idea that there is some protocol that people need to be able to understand so that people don't feel um, less confident, they don't feel uncomfortable with it. So I'm going to just go here on my little cheat sheet here. 
as I'm moving on down here so I don't forget. Um, here's something um, in regard to courtesy, and that is introducing people. How many times are you talking with one person, another person comes up, and the screen goes blank? You know, your, your screen of the brain goes blank, they're walking, you go, I know, I know this person, I know, I know this person, retrieval, 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 and it's just coming up blank, you know, whatever it is. That is not an excuse not to introduce people, because you're going to find that people, you want to be a benefit to other people. If you can't remember someone's name, here are a few hints for you. If I know the person I'm with, I immediately say, I don't remember this person's name, please introduce yourself, right, and they'll go ahead. Or I'll say, have you two had an opportunity to meet? You can't do that if the person just came off a plane from Australia that had never been to the United States, and they randomly. But you can always you know, say to somebody, I'm sorry, I'm having a bad day. I, I, can you please help me out? That's Barbara. And then they'll go ahead and say their name. Another thing that I'll do is that if I am going ahead and introducing somebody, and I, and I introduce them, I try and find something that's common between the two of them. I try and find something so they can talk about um, with one another. This is particularly really good if you're at any kind of reception or party that you're being able to be a connector, you know, that you know two people really enjoy knowing one another, so being a benefit. Remembering names. So this is, this is not easy, but there, I, one woman is immediately already, she's going, I know, I know, when you think of my age, then you'll really know. Um, <laughs> you will find that remembering names. So someone says their name, and this is what you're supposed to do. Right? You're supposed to repeat the name. I can do that part. And they walk away, and it's like a bubble, and it just goes by. <laughs> so there was this great article in the, um, the New York Times, and it was called, I think, like the, the mind, um, I have the name of it, like the mind-changing game. But it was basically about a reporter, and he was going to study how people remembered numbers. It was a front cover magazine story. And he decided, well, it was really diligence. Right? It was not an inherent gift that somebody had, but it would be, you know, people train themselves. So he decided, well, I'll train myself. And he went to the experts. Well, the end of the story was he became the champion, mm -hmm. uh, which was remarkable. And he learned how to remember people's names was the transferable skill from this. And what you do is that you meet somebody, and then you immediately make an association. So you've heard that before. But the key, you make it really weird <laughs> and maybe even a little kinky. Because that will make you don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to say, you know what I thought of you when I first met you? No one ever needs to know. But the more strange it is, the easier it will be for you to remember that name. And so that is another thing for you to be able to do is to make that association. And it is a skill. There's no doubt about it. It is that practice. I'm just starting small on license plates. I try and remember those, but it is something to be able to introduce people. You introduce somebody, and when you go ahead, it's always nice to introduce the person of higher authority first. It's not really that important. The whole idea is that if you're being genuine is the most important, but if you can remember to always say the most important person's name first, then you're introducing them. Uh, so I would go ahead, and if I were going to be introducing, oh, I don't know, um, uh, Raylene to Marsha. Uh, now, I have no idea because these are two women that I know, um, but I'm going to say it's uh, President Marsha. Sorry, Raylene. Um, and I would say, President Marsha, may I please introduce you to Raylene, uh, Raylene Ludgate. Raylene, I'd like to introduce you to Marsha E. Sheetley. So this would be how you would do it. You'd always say the most important person's name first. And then there's a handshake. All right, should we go through a little bit of the handshake? All right, we're going to do this really quickly. So I need, I need a volunteer for the handshake. I need a volunteer for the handshake. It takes about an hour to get here. Thank you. Because this does say something about you as well and about common courtesy. Uh, so, what is your name, please? Derek. Derek. All right, Derek, Barbara. So, this is what happens, and this is what happens with women, all right, very often. So, we're going to go ahead and just introduce ourselves. How do you do, Barbara Lund? Hi, I'm Derek Evans. Did <laughs> <laughs> I to see that? And you, I love it. You always. Uh, some people call it like you know the dead squirrel. Some people call it um, the queen's handshake. Um, only the queen does this. So women, don't collapse your hand um, and try and grab on. Uh, that, that's not a good thing to be able to do. And we're going to do another one now. How do you do, Barbara Line? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, uh, you're the dead fish. Going I did have the dead fish going on. <laughs> and this is the thing about cultural differences. In this country, it is looked upon that if you have a soft handshake, oh, that means that you're not secure. Oh, that means that you're non-assertive. That might not be the case at all, but here in this country, it's how it's perceived. In other countries, it is a sign of respect. It has nothing to do with that at all. So it's to be conscious of who it is that you are meeting, of whether or not you want to be able to have a firmer handshake. Women tend to have a softer handshake than men. Not the women in the vet school. <laughs> I, I have done sessions for them for many years. They can take a cow down with their <laughs> So here's another one, Derek. So I am going to be Bob. Okay. All right. You're still Derek. Okay. You can stay Same character. You're doing a great job. I'm not Linda. Or You're not Linda. You could be Linda, but I'm going to be Bob. All right. How do you do Bob line? Oh, Derek Ellison. Nice to meet you. How's that? Um, a little firm, you held on for a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and that's it. I'll talk about holding on for a while. Men, I know you do this. I know because I've had confessions. So two men shake hands. One squeeze a little harder. One's a little harder, a little harder, a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is no need for the bone crusher. Uh, that, that is not a sign. And women, you don't need to think, I'm going to be assertive. Oh, yeah, come on. Give me that. <laughs> you don't need to do that at all. And then there is another one that you can do. And this is my fantasy, so I'm going to be um, president line. You're out, you're out of office. <laughs> How do you do? Barber line. Good afternoon, Derek Evanson. The person of a higher authority, the person who is the host, the person who is welcoming somebody, is the one who then takes the hand and puts it on the other person's hand. So if you see President Obama, in fact, tonight, State of the Union, I think, is going on. If you see him starting to walk down the chamber, he's shaking hands. Typically, people do not go ahead and take their hand and place it on his. He does it for everybody else. Uh, now, when I was on the ship, uh, Desmond Tutu was on the ship. So this is really thrilling, and everybody got to shake Desmond Tutu's hand. So I get my photo of me shaking his hand. And who's got her hand on Desmond Tutu's hand? <laughs> and, you know, now, he did it to me first. All right? so he had, but it's the idea of it's not like this horrible thing the intent is is true, and I was responding to his warm handshake. But it's that idea of just to simply be aware is what you want to be able to do. So the other thing, and when we just said it, so some of us, how do you do? And we're chatting, and I'm not letting go. And really, it's getting creepy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> on, keep on holding on, and so what do I do? Excuse me. <coughs> I just, I just, I break away, and I pretend that I cough. As opposed to let go of my hand. <laughs> so anyway, those are thank you very much, Derek. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> um, those are just some things that have to do with the actual meeting with somebody. Um, you are going to be again in the office situation. I want to talk about emails because emails are fraught with peril. Um, in ways that we don't really realize. So that when you think about it, and there's a certain breakdown of communication. So 7% is words. Um, oh, I don't know what the other percentages are. I think it's like 47 is tone, and the rest of it's body language. The point is, 7% of communication is words. So you think you've got 93% chance of getting misinterpreted. The odds are not in your favor. Um, which is why when you are doing an email, um, there are a few things. One is to figure out whether or not it's, um, one person put it, Philip put it in his book, Philip Gellings, he put it as, oh my God, OMG, which I kind of like. And it was, you know, the O is uh, the only. In other words, if it's just something that is a friendly conversation, then you go ahead and you do it through email. If suddenly there needs to be a message that's important, is when you start to really look at your email. And a good email, a good email is going to be one where the subject heading actually is about the subject. It's not hey, uh, uh, but it says something because people can then go find it. And that when you're opening it, that you have a greeting, you have a salutation. I brought an email that I had from two different adult lifelong learners. One was, hi, Barbara. Fun to hear from our fearless leader. Yay. Thanks for doing this. I wasn't able to open your document, though. Can you send it another way? Thank you, Betsy. Here's another one. Hey, <laughs> how many lifelong learners will be on this cruise? Can you email me a list? No, it's can you email B a list? <laughs> Are there any more from Arizona? No, that, that's it. No, thank you. No. So I immediately, you know, had all this opportunity for misinterpretation. How many of you have gotten an email and it just nags at you? It just gnaws at you. What do they mean by that? 
You know, what do they mean? Or you write an email that's really long, it's beautiful, it's a work of art, you really framed it, you put it in Word so that you made sure there were no errors. You send it to someone and they respond back, THX. Like, like not good job, look forward to reading it. The idea is that when you have gotten a thoughtful response from a thoughtful email, you respond in a way that acknowledges their effort. You can also realize that with a smartphone, what you have 40 characters on a page, is that to realize that a lot of people are checking their messages, so that if you have something that has an attachment to it, you explain in the subject heading uh, what the email is about, and then in the email body, number 40, uh, 40 images as it were, that you then say what's in the attachment, so a person will know what's in the attachment rather than making it a mystery. Um, you don't want to, as you know, uh, have emails that are emotional. There is a new uh, uh, program. It's called Tone Check. Anybody know Tone Check? So Tone Check is something that's been put out by Microsoft, and that it can basically assess the 200 emotions that you could potentially be conveying in your email message. It might be a little extreme, but it's the idea that for the most part, our emails can be entirely misconstrued. This is really the case when you are talking about something that is sensitive, that is going to be personal, that is about conflict, that is about maybe you want to leave your job. The most famous email exchange that was on all the websites and on the news stations, if you've not heard of it, was by two lawyers. I don't know if you've heard of this one or not, but basically you had one lawyer, uh, a candidate, and she was writing and said, thank you very much, but I won't be accepting your offer. It wasn't enough money. And then I decided I'm going to go on my own, and I'm going to just see how it all shakes out. Thank you. <coughs> Email back from the person who interviewed her. I'm sorry to hear about that. I had thought after the two interviews and our discussion that it was a, uh, an agreement that you'd be with us. Unfortunately, I had made the stationery. I wish I had known that there was this much conflict going on. I wish you had said something. She writes back. Well, if you're a lawyer, you ought to know how to write a contract, and that you should have probably put this all in writing and rather than making assumptions. And then he wrote back, you know, you're young in this industry, it's a small industry, you might not want to be pissing people off. <laughs> and her response, blah, blah, blah. It went all over the internet. I mean, it went all over the internet, and names everything. The idea being that when you write an email, nothing is confidential. Nothing is confidential. And so it's that idea of writing it with that tone that's going to be appropriate, that you don't say hey, that you say greetings, and you, and you, you, know, you have it that it's going to be that people are going to appreciate what it is that you're saying in the email. If it's something that you should be saying in person, or if a person calls you, don't respond with an email. Don't respond on Facebook, uh, because they're going to think that you're avoiding them. Is that if someone calls you, that means that they want to be able to talk to you. So I realize that face to face, if a conflict is going on for the oh my god, the OMG, you know, it is get you know get to them face to face. In other words, if there's any kind of emotion attached to it, then call them up or go right to them. Don't think that your emails back and forth that volley is going to be de-escalating. It's only going to escalate whatever is going to be going on. So you want to be kind of careful with that misinterpretation that you're going to be having. So I'm going to, I could, I, I could, I, you could probably know I could go on for hours here. I have a little takeout sheet for you um, here. Uh, if there's anything in particular that you want me to talk about, and if not, I will absolutely just continue going on, uh, which is always my way anyway. But is there anything that people um, in their minds that they see on there that they want me to address? And if not, I'll just forge ahead. Uh, um, you mentioned that the protocol, there's maybe not a specific thing to do that you sort of assess what's going, what the protocol is, to right. have sort of um, an approach to sort of ex assessing what is appropriate protocol given the I do. So uh, it's about assessing the different protocol that people have. You know, very often if you mirror somebody else, that you take a look at how they're sitting. Um, it tells you a lot about their comfort level and that um, every, it, it's, um, it's going to change for every single person, but here's, here's one way of being able to avoid being rude. Someone, you, you talk to someone and you ask them, so what did you do this weekend? Oh, I went, I went cross-country skiing out um, in Ellis Hollow. Oh, I love cross-country skiing. I was just out in Vail and I went cross-country skiing. It was fabulous in Vail. Have you ever been to Vail? <laughs> Switching a conversation so it's now focused on you and diminishing the other person. Um, if I'm talking to somebody, what I'm doing is that I'm trying as much as I can and I make mistakes all the time. Um, is trying to listen to what they have to say, ask them questions that are about them being able to respond to me, but I'm also mirroring 
their behavior themselves. Um, I'm going to be very different to a 15-year-old than I am to a 65-year-old. I'm going to be very different to someone in a professional setting than I am in a casual setting. But there is a saying by Maya Angelou, and this is paraphrasing again, and, and she will say, you know, people will not remember what it is that you said, people will not remember what it is that you did, people will remember how you made them feel. So it's that idea of can I make someone feel as though I have acknowledged them, appreciated them. Um, it's not going to be, with some people, it's going to be a more formal way of talking. Um, if you really need, I need more instruction, then I would say to go to Philip Delanus's book, because he has a Y axis and, a, and an X axis. And he's got important, not so important, don't care, don't give a flying leap. And then it goes ahead and then it'll have these other little uh, areas of checking. And then you kind of decide also, um, you know, what is going to make this person comfortable or uncomfortable? And what is your intent? Um, and you know, it's all about that intent. You know, if I want, I can clearly be snarky. Um, and sometimes I will be just that. And I wonder, why was I just that way? You know, um, why did I, you know, or I say something and I wonder, why did I just say what I said? It's that idea of what is my intent when I've done something? You know, there's a whole idea that when you have um, uh, confrontation or you have interaction with expectation is manipulation. In other words, if you're going in with this intent of just wanting to know somebody, exchange information, and you don't have this intent, I'm not there to try to impress them, I'm not there for all these other reasons, I'm always kind of witnessing myself. And very often I'm going, my oh my, we haven't learned very much, have we? Um, and it is that idea of being corrected, of self-corrected. So it's, I know it's a sort of a long way of um, probably not saying very much, which brings me to, but not saying very much. When somebody says something to you that's rude, so I was on the ship, and there's a gentleman on the ship, and I was talking to the group, and he said, that is the most I've ever heard someone talk about and not say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at the man, and I said, John, sometimes I'm just eye candy. <laughs> of being able to manage um, individuals, you know? And it's kind of that challenge of how do you do something, how do you interact with someone who's difficult and not escalating it? You're not enabling them. But there's another person that he once said to me, Barbara, you know, you're an acquired, there's someone on the ship, you are an acquired taste. <laughs> acquired taste? <laughs> Fish sauce, that's an acquired taste. It's smelly, it stinks, but you kind of get used to it after a while. And he said to me, no, 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 no. I, I, no, I don't, I don't mean that. I mean, and he meant something else. But it was that idea that he realized that what he just said, the way in which it sounded, wasn't the, his intent. And so he went ahead and immediately tried to explain. In fact, I just got an email from him this morning, which so I'm thinking of it, because he said, um, if you ever need a letter of reference, I will write it for you. I will not write that you were acquired taste. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on here? I would like to address questions that people might have. Please. We have a whole section on storytelling. Oh, so storytelling, it is all about storytelling. Um, and storytelling is that if you want to be able to get a point across, and it's particularly true whether you're, whether you're an instructor or you're a student, is to tell a story. Because stories are extremely powerful, and stories are going to be um, the first thing about a story. And there's a book called The Truth of Storytelling, and there are four truths of storytelling. One, it has to be authentic. It has to be true to the storyteller. So which is why when I, when I do presentations, I tell stories, because they're the best way for you to be able to convey it, rather than me saying, be polite, have manners, sit like this. Telling a story is going to be giving all that. So telling a story it has to be true to the person. The second part of storytelling is that it has to be relevant to the person to whom you're speaking. Uh, because that same story is going to change for whomever you're talking to a little bit so that it's going to be customized for the, for the people, the person that you're going to be talking to. Which means that the story has to also um, shift when, depending upon what the circumstance is. Now when I help students frame themselves for job interviews, it's all about storytelling. I mean, when you look at a resume, it is all, the, every line of a resume is a movie trailer. And all you're trying to do is say, ask me more. You give them a little bit of information, you quantify, you have outcomes. A resume is not a laundry list. A resume is about the beginning of stories. And every line of a resume, you should have a story behind. So if someone asks you something, you can go ahead and tell it. Um, but I teach people how do you tell your, how do you identify your story, and then how do you tell your story. 
so that a person's going to realize you've convinced them that whatever your resume said, whatever the point is you're trying to make, you've just convinced them and persuaded them through a story. You do, you, it's true what it is that you say about yourself. So that's about the storytelling part. You have a, something here about women as hosts, but can you say something about are the differences between oh, men and women? Oh, men and hosts. I rag on the men. It's time for me to rag on the women. <laughs> uh, women, if you have to pull it up or pull it down, it is too tight. <laughs> um, it's a different generation, and I used to go ahead and I would, uh, I do, um, how do you dress? And so I would always do a few things that were wrong with my dress. Usually three things were wrong. Well, one day I did a presentation, they were up to number 10. Right? They were going to ask my mother's pearls, and that's when I decided I would no longer do it. Um, and I, one person I said, what about my dress? She said, well, it is, um, you know, it's too baggy on you. And I realized that you know, the generations are very different in, their, in the way in which we dress. But all I can say is that they were in an event, and even though this woman is not in the audience, and if I ever cross her, I did not do her a service because we were at an event, and she was ample. All right? The Lord made her ample. And she had it dressed just down to there. And may I say, <laughs> <laughs> they ought to have been put away. I mean, that, that, it was just so distracting. So it really is something for women as far as your dress to be appropriately dressed. Women as hosts, as business, it's, it's neutral gender. But the problem that with women um, being hosts, it's often when the check comes. And when the check comes and that you are the host, uh, you're going to find that very often maybe an older gentleman um, is going to want to take the check. And so the best thing, particularly for younger women, don't worry, my age, they're thrilled I take the check. Um, <laughs> but, but for younger women, if you need to be able to take the check, what you do is that during a meal, you excuse yourself, and then you actually go to the host stand, you have to run the check, and then um, in the end of the meal, when the check comes and everyone's lunging to pay the check, you can say it's already taken care of. And that way you're not in this hassle of who's going to be taking the check. Um, that is it. But for men, sometimes you're screwed, right? Because I'm always, oh, gender neutral. So does that mean I don't open the door? Does that mean I don't pull out a chair? Does that mean I sit um, um, and I stay seated when a woman gets up? Well, it depends. You know, if, you, if, if your mother's voice, your grandmother's voice, your aunt's voice, your neighbor's voice says, woman walks in the room, you stand. Right? Woman's about to sit down, you pull out the chair. The thing for men, if a woman is the host, depending upon the woman, she might think that if you go ahead and you get the door, or you're pulling out the chair, that you're saying that you're the host. You're the alpha male, as it were. This is the woman's perception. You might be just doing what your grandmother told you to do. But with the thing to do, you can always just say, may I get the chair for you? And then we can say yes or no. Whomever gets to the door first is the person that opens the door, unless they're with a walker. <laughs> so, you know, you want to be able to, you know, common sense, but it's the idea, it's like being in a buffet line. You get one plate, right, and then you go in the buffet line, next time just do this. Take two plates, and take one plate and give it to the person behind you, right, not everybody. <laughs> but just that one, and it's this, you just do these like little acts of grace, these little moments of courtesy. And the whole day gets sort of spotted with all these little moments of courtesy. And it's when you're being part of the solution, not part of the problem, when people are together. So that was the woman with hosts. Uh, final question, please, or maybe two more. Well, Go ahead. Well, uh, just had an experience a while ago uh, speaking to an alumni group in uh, California. And we're supposed to represent the wine and grape program here. And so they were all interested in that. And after a little presentation, I asked for questions, and somebody stood up and said, aren't they ever going to make any decent wine in New York? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't answer me. <laughs> what my answer be? What my, my answer be to that? Was it here, that here? Um, no, it was in California. Oh, in California. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that I, I lived in Napa for a very long time. Uh, and you know, to say, clearly you've not had that opportunity to taste our wines. They are, they are terrific. And you don't need to make excuses for the back, but you do something positive in, as far as the front. But you turn it around. I mean, you, you just turn it around so that you don't diminish the other person. You know, really? Really, that's what you think of New York wines? Yeah, we've been, we've been at this for a long time now. And suddenly it's like, come on, you want to fight? I'll fight. You know, it's really easy to do that. So you just want to spin that around. Because people will do that. Absolutely. Uh, the food preferences uh, using Corsair. 
Oh, so there's food preferences. And we'll stop because food is basically what I love to talk about anyway. Um, so as far as food goes, if you have, you're vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, lactose intolerant, you go through it, and you need to go to an event. Um, I won't tell you the whole story, but the bottom line is arrange for it beforehand. All right, call ahead of time. If it's a banquet, call ahead of time. If it's a restaurant, call ahead of time. Um, do something so you're not looking like high maintenance. Uh, because you're going to find that when you, particularly if you're being taken out for any kind of a business lunch, interview lunch, anything like that, people are not taking you out because they think that you need to be fed. Right? They are taking you out because they want to see what you are like in a social situation. How is it that you are responding to other people? You know, the server is the person, if you're at a banquet and they're serving 25 people all at once in a banquet hall, you go, oh, I'm sorry, I don't eat chicken. And all of a sudden, it's like a Visa commercial. You take out the credit card, and everyone is using the credit card. One person takes out cash, and everybody falls over everybody else. You stop the rhythm of the night. Well, the same thing at a banquet if, or in a, in a restaurant if you don't do that pre-planning. doesn't mean that you should eat food you don't want to eat, but you do want to be able to just make sure that you're not imposing on other people. And the last thing, because it's 110 and it's 112, so we're going to have to end it. I know that. Um, is it to use humor? Um, to please, if, when in doubt, not at someone else's expense. Sarcasm is a very dangerous road to, to go on because sarcasm always has that little bit of cruelty to it. Whether or not you think it does or not, it always has that little peck that uh, is diminishing somebody else. Uh, but if you can do things that, and I'll give you this, my last story is that I do triathlons. When I started doing triathlons, I, all these people like buffed. And we all were putting on wetsuits, and I'm, we're at a lake. And I go behind the bush, and I put on my wetsuit. I come out, and everyone is staring at me. I go, what? What? I say, it, it, it's, it's on backwards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, zip up, right? And I said, well, there's no way this thing is coming off. <laughs> uh, you know? And I didn't swim backwards. I swam forwards. But it was an idea of you know, people very often think that, um, particularly people who are shy, and there's a difference between shy and introverted. It's a whole other conversation. People who are shy, they um, are very concerned about other, how other people view them and how they judge them. Um, so that if someone laughs at them, they think they're laughing at them, it's mortifying to them. So it's like take yourself a little more lightly um, and have a sense of humor about yourself uh, when you go forward so that you really can go ahead and apply what Maya says and what everyone else says. But it's that idea of being of benefit, not focusing so much on yourself, but making sure that the people with whom you are speaking are feeling as though they're the only person in the room and that you are giving them your full attention and your appreciation. And with that, I say thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.